Good morning. Thank you. I need the love. Uh, my name is Eric Horwitz, and I'm the head coach of the Columbia University Career Coaching Network. We offer executive coaching and career coaching to Columbia alumni. There's about 25 coaches who went to some part of Columbia University and uh, offer this service, and I, uh, I'm the leader of that group. So today we're going to be doing a very interactive session on motivation and persuasion. And this is something that we're hoping you benefit from in terms of the groups that you work with within Columbia, but also within your career. So hope you'll enjoy this and you'll learn a lot uh, for both areas of your life. And it's going to be very interactive. So you're going to get to know each other a little bit better. So all of us, you know, it's a little shy. It's a little, you know, oh, oh, I don't know anyone. By the end, you'll feel comfortable. You'll get to know people. And it's going to be wonderful. And uh, are we ready to start? We're ready. We're going. Okay. So um, just a little bit of background on me. I worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers for about 15 years in HR consulting. And then I decided I wanted to become a coach, which was a career transition for me. So I learned a lot along the way around how to, one, motivate people, because that's part of what you learn when you manage teams, but also how to persuade individuals that I could be their coach, okay? So what we're gonna learn today, just within your role in, you, uh, in your life is one, is how to get people who you're not paying to do something, and then how to persuade them to act on that which is, which is not, not so simple. So first, we're going to start off with just some ideas around, uh, around motivation, okay? So I've, I've put up some ideas to think about when you think about what actually motivates people. And the word motivation comes word move, which relates to energy, right? So just the pure act of being motivated has to do with energy. Is anyone here uh, was a physics major? Science? Okay, good. So I can make stuff up and nobody's going to know. <laughs> so um, when we think about motivation, generally human beings are motivated by things like fear, inertia, the fear of inertia, meaning, oh, I'm not doing anything. Um, once you're moving, you can keep moving. An object in motion stays in motion, right? That one. Okay. Other things that motivate people, for example, is status. So in other words, how am I perceived relative to other people? That's a, that's a key motivator. So people don't actually take an action until they see perhaps someone else take an action. Uh, time. So the, the thing that we cannot make more of is time, right? We can make more space. We can make more money. We can have more friends. But... We can't make more time. So people are often motivated by the idea that I'm running out of time, okay? Or creating urgency. So if you're working with a group of people, particularly that they're not, let's say you're in employment, they're in this group together, the sense of being motivated by how much time I have is an important motivator. Um, the opportunity for joy and excitement and something new is also a great human motivator. And then finally, probably the truest scientific motivation is gravity, right? Which pulls everything together and makes things connect, okay? So fundamentally, all objects are in motion, right? Every planet, the sun, all of us are moving, okay? So understanding that when you're trying to get momentum uh, or to be motivated, it's sort of like it's natural. It's natural to be in a state of movement. Okay? So these are just some concepts to kind of put in your head around what are the things that motivate people. Now, we'll get a little bit more specific as we go along about how to enact that motivation. Okay. All right. So now those are some concepts around motivation. Now we're going to talk about ways in which we persuade. Okay. So persuade is to convince someone that the motivation should be towards what you want, okay? So I can be motivated, but how do I get you motivated to do what I want you to do, okay? So, for example, I work with a lot of Columbia alumni. Logic is a great one, 
okay? So A plus B equals C. That will work to persuade. But that will work to persuade a very specific group of people and may not persuade them enough to have them act. Just, they might agree, but not act, okay? Repetition, so if you think about politicians, politicians will repeat the same point, key point, over and over and over again, okay? So if you want to persuade, true or not true, you just say the same thing over and over again, eventually people might act on that persuasion, okay? Greed, the idea that maybe at some point I'll be able to make more money will persuade someone to do something. Fear of, if, the fear of not doing it. If you do not do this thing, here's what might happen to you. And in general, and this is true in coaching, it's like carrot and stick, the fear is a 52% greater motivator than hope, okay? So that's just human nature because, you know, we would go outside and then there was a, a dragon or a lion and he'd eat us, okay? So that was fundamentally what we were dealing with. So basically, if you want to persuade people, the idea of a little bit of fear is probably better than a lot of bit of hope. And sometimes when you're running groups or teams, you know, you think, oh, I'm going to be super positive and everyone's going to gather around me with my positivity. So the idea is, you know, a little bit of anxiety also works, okay? So let me talk a little bit about ego and emotion, okay? So growing your ego or protecting your ego is a great way to persuade people. So appealing to them personally about how this enhances and increases their ego is a way to persuade. If you do this, you will be famous, you will be smart, you will be respected, okay? On the opposite side of that, human beings are pack animals, therefore they need community, okay? We don't exist separate from other, from other individuals. So on the one hand, you can persuade with ego, you're gonna be separate and important, and for other people, you're gonna belong. And the sense of belonging is a great persuader. Uh, anyone want to share, like, why did so someone here come to this uh, alumni weekend? What, what was your motivation? Who wants to share? Yes. Networking. networking. Why, why do you want to network? So you want to connect with others. Yes. How about you? Connection. Making connections. Okay. So, again, when we think about persuasion, Columbia persuaded you that becoming here would allow you to have a sense of community, okay? And what's, what's interesting in the 21st century is we can have a digital community, but there's still something about being connected to human beings together, which is more attractive, okay? All right, and then, the, see, I put logic at the top, but I put emotion at the bottom. So actually, just like I said, 52% fear is stronger than hope. Emotion is about 72% more powerful than logic, okay? So if you want to compel someone to do something, using emotion and feeling is far stronger than using logic, okay? And getting to the core of that. So in your written communication, in your verbal communication, thinking about, sorry, I just screwed up. I said thinking feeling about how somebody will feel about something is way more powerful than how they think about it, okay? So, for example, I don't know if someone want to share, how do, you, how do you feel about Columbia University? Feel about it. Who wants to share something they feel about Columbia? Yes. We are, I am not me, we are we. Okay, so you feel connected, connected, okay? Someone else want to share how they feel about Columbia? Yes. Nostalgic. That's a great one. I was, right, I was outside with my Instagram. I'm like, there's my dorm room from senior year. Uh, by the way, I just want to say, I was third in the lottery senior year. So that means I got the third best room in Fernald. Okay? So nostalgia, I feel that, right? I actually had a, like, I, my senior year was all messed up and I couldn't find a job. So it didn't matter, but I felt nostalgic. That's a great one. Okay, someone else want to share something they feel about Columbia? Yes. Grateful. grateful. Okay, what are you grateful for? Okay, so, so it, it's, almost like, it's almost like family or home, something like that. So again, when we think about 
motivating and persuading through emotion that's so abstract in a way. Like it feels like home. Well, no one has a problem with home, right? But if I had a logical conversation with you about it, you might have, we might go off in a completely different direction. Okay, does someone just want to share what they think about Columbia University, not feel? Okay, so you think about its purpose. Its purpose, right, okay? All right, good. So these are just some tools you can take a picture of if you like um, around things or ways of being in order to persuade. Okay. All right, now we're going to do the interactive part. Okay. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to break up into five groups, and we're going to do this with numbering, just like you're in like fourth grade or something like that. And we're, I've picked five topics, okay? And in your group, you're going to do two things. You're going to pick a point of view on that topic. Then you're going to pick a leader to persuade the other groups of why this is the way it should be and what you want them to do about it. Okay? And I've picked five super compelling topics. Okay, N topic number one. Should we have a four-day work week? Okay, now this is my rule. We work four days a week, nine to five, or whatever, close to that, but you get paid for five days. Okay, why, is this, why should this be? We've had all this efficiency in the last 30 years. There isn't as much work to do, okay? So ra rather than getting all the profits, we can have everyone work four days and get paid for five, okay? So that's one group. It's got to convince either yes or no and why. Group number two is how would you convince someone to give Columbia University a million dollars? Presuming that person, you can make up however long, how much money you think they have. Okay, number three. What would be the way to convince your boss, if you have a boss, that you need a raise, okay? You could also do it, how would you convince, let's say if you have, you're an entrepreneur, convince a client to give you more money, okay? So that's number three. Okay, number four, for, do we have any economics majors here? Just me? Okay, that's great. I had no idea what I was learning or anything. I was just, but I did well. I read my senior economics paper. It's like about macroeconomics. It was kind of really smart and I don't understand a word of it now. <laughs> And I got an A minus. Okay, so should the federal minimum wage be increased? Okay, so that's number four. And number five is are smartphones better for your life and work? Now, I think everybody here, yeah, it seems like everyone here existed before the smartphone, right? Okay, that's, that makes, when was the smartphone made? 2007. Yes, okay, so you were all alive before the smartphone. Okay, so. These are the five topics. All right, so we're gonna do this thing. We're gonna count off one to five. And if you are in group one, you're gonna go there. Group two is there, group three there, group four there, and group five there. And you're gonna to have to talk about, I'll bring the topics back, and you're gonna talk about the topic. You're gonna to have to agree to your point of view and then come up with these actions. And you're like, but I don't even know these people, and I just got here, right? So this is part of the exercise of having to do this. And so there isn't a right or wrong answer when we go to play the actual game. It's just you're gonna learn about how to do this, this type of interaction, okay? All right, so one, two, three, four. <laughs> We're going to start with team number three. Okay? You're number three? So you're the, you're the speaker? So I'm the speaker. So speak the camera. Okay. So uh, after introducing ourselves and our uh, affiliations, we addressed the question, and uh, some strategy ideas were thrown out. Uh, some of them were very factual. In other words, have your performance levels, have, have done your research about what your role is worth in the marketplace. Um, come back with information about comparative uh, performance in the group and so forth. But then there were some um, real negotiating strategies that uh, were suggested, which were um, get a better offer from out of house, 
um, come in with that in the first place, and then come in with a, a kind of a maximalist strategy. Shoot for the stars and the moon, and make it an argument about how this strategy is actually in the best interest of not only getting your immediate superiors uh, moving up the ladder, but getting uh, their superiors, uh, making them their superiors look good as well. And then state your case, argue your case very strongly, ask for the sun, the moon, and the stars, and then shut up. They're going to be knocked off their rocker, they're gonna be falling on the floor, maybe they'll be upset, able to be surprised and shocked, but then wait and see what comes back. Actually interact with the issues that they bring up. Um, that's, that's the strategy. That's your strategy. And then what, are, what would be an action you would ask your boss in this case to do in order to know that you persuaded them? In order for me to know that I... Uh, you pitched for your raise that you persuaded them. I would, I would literally be quiet and wait to hear and see what their response is and, and respond to that. Okay. Uh, in, so you're a poker face. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In the industry that I'm coming from, Which is? Uh, financial planning, insurance, you never know the budget of the person you're talking to. Uh, I met a guy kicking him in, in various places at a martial arts training thing who said, it in, I thought he was a real estate agent. He was a developer. His budget was 10, 10, 50 million. I had no idea. I wouldn't have known unless I asked. So don't assume about your audience. Correct. Correct. Okay, when you said make a, uh, a cohesive argument, is it a logical one or an emotional one? And what might be an emotional argument to a boss? An emotional argument yeah, to the boss. Emotional. Yeah, the emotional argument is, I'm, I'm, first of all, I, I, I'm so sorry that, because my passion, my heart, is to be here with all of you. This is my team, this is my life, this is my, uh -huh. but I can't afford at what I'm currently making right now to do that. And unfortunately, these competitors have come along and they're enticing me. They're hitting me in my weak spot, which is my financial need. So if I can't, uh, I, you know, my, my desire, of course, would be to help them grow this amazing institution and these, my family here. Okay, so I just want you to add a little bit of fear <clears throat> yeah. towards that, your boss yeah. and, that, and that whole spiel, as we say, you just gave. Um, listen. I know that we've been working together as an incredible team and the vision we have together, and it's my goal to make that happen. I'd hate to see that fail. Yeah. I can't imagine okay. who else here is going to jump into all of this structure we've created right. and fly it. Excellent. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Number three. So you get points for enthusiasm, articulation, speed of delivery, okay? I didn't tell you there's a prize at the end, because there isn't. Um, but whatever, maybe, you, you'll, you'll get pride and, and importance. Okay, who wants to go second? Okay. You guys are four day work week. Okay, ready? Just say your name, say something special about yourself. Yes. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Maria Paola. Uh, I'm actually not an alumni, I'm an infiltrated student, so. Um, but yeah, I'm really glad to be able to share with a lot of alumni. Um, so we were discussing uh, how we all agree we should have a four day week. So there were no no, no. <laughs> and then I was like wondering, well, if we all agree, why is this not happening? Uh, yeah, uh, so we were um, talking about these more logical arguments, like, oh, people are going to be more efficient, and when, when people are happy, people are efficient. And then we were like looking for those emotional uh, arguments, like children, like, were you ever a child? Did your parents wear enough time with you when you were a child? Like, so now imagine my child that has to be home alone or like with the nanny all the time. Like, that, is that the future kids that we want? Like, they have mobile phones. Do you want like a uh, robot kids? No, you, no one wants that. Like, we need to be sharing time with our kids. You're so, uh huh. Yeah, so like that was a big one. And that, that, that was like our stronger, well, for me it, it was, but like how to persuade about like um, 
we're going to be more uh, more pro productive if we um, strategize towards like being more organized. And there's these um, I don't know how you how you you will call it here, but it's like your uh, chair warmer. So you're sitting there just like warming your chair, not really working. Right. But if it's a four day four day week, then you have to be working when you're there. It's like there's no time for like being socializing and like going outside to have breakfast. You just have to get everything done because you have less time. Okay, and what would be an action you would take or would you want your team to take in order to move this forward? I would say, like, oh, let's just try it. Ah, that's good, okay. Experiment. Like, let, uh huh. Try it and, like, let's see if it works. Okay, like, that's great. Okay, thank you. All right, it's number two. Are people, are people convinced? Four day work week? Yes, okay. Just so you know, there used to be a six day work week, right? And it went to five. Do you know why it went to five? All over the world. Because people came to work drunk. On the, on, the, on the Sunday, because they worked on su or Saturday, whichever day. So they said, well, let's give them an extra day, day so they won't have a hangover. And somehow the whole world agreed to this situation. <laughs> who knew? I think it was during the time of prohibition, probably. <laughs> um, okay, who wants to go next? Here we go. What team are you guys? You're team two? What, what's your top? Oh, you're going to convince me to give you a million dollars. Okay, I just need a... <laughs> As you know, Columbia University is a university of great stature, and that comes at, you know, at a cost, it needs to be maintained. And to maintain our status um, in the world and in academia, we need to support the professors, recruit the best students, and this is the reason why uh, we need you all to contribute a million dollars. For those who have it, uh, there are tools that the university offers, like a gift annuity. You don't have to do it in one shot. So you can give um, a long-term gift. Uh, and a gift annuity has the benefit, for instance, of um, um, lifetime income at an interest rate that might be more favorable than wherever you've had it invested. Now, if you don't have a million dollars, there are other approaches to gift giving. And Mike, Sharon will. Hi, so for all of you that have a million dollars, that's okay, we take cash, check, credit card, <laughs> cash app, Venmo, whatever, however you wanna give, we're ready. You know, coins or whatever, bring it up. But we realize that the thought of giving a million dollars if you don't have a million dollars is a barrier, right? It's a, how do I do this? Not that I don't want to, because all the reasons we gave are good, but how do I do this, right? So if you don't have it right now, we'll take it over time. You can make a monthly pledge, you can take out uh, an insurance policy and you pay the premium and make Columbia the beneficiary so that when you move on to a better life, we can also move on to a better life because we get a million dollars, right? <laughs> right? But there are a variety of ways to think out of the box to get the million dollars. It's not like we're looking for your cash check and Venmo right now if you can't do that. We'll be willing to be very creative and get a million dollars over the course of your life or, or your kid's life if you're willing to mortgage them. You know, we put, <laughs> you know, but however you want to do it, whatever you want to come up with, we're willing to be creative with you. All right, very good. So the persuasive thing that they did was they boiled it down into something much smaller and much simpler so that it seemed more possible. So that was a powerful argument to make it seem not so scary. The thing you would also want to think about, though, is right at the end, what's your closing statement that works so well? So in other words, you might say, you know, and it's, it, no matter what, it's easy, it's good, and we can make it happen. Remember I said the repeated thing over and over? But excellent. Okay. Uh, I think, here we go. What's your, t what's your topic? Minimum wage. minimum wage. Are we raising the minimum wage? We just did in New York, right? Okay, here we go. Thank you. 
All righty, so I'm Carol Ann Arvin with the Columbia Club of Atlanta, and our group had the discussion of $15 minimum wage. The way we kicked it off is we first just took a straw vote to see where people came out, and we were eight to two in favor of going the minimum wage. And then we had a discussion to figure out, well, what were the um, items for the, the issues for the people who voted against it? And it turned out we all had the same consensus, which was we were concerned about the worker. Uh, the reason they voted no is they thought technology or automation might replace the workers' low-income jobs with a higher wage. Um, and the other point was that we thought inflation might kick up with a $15 minimum wage. That, too, would hurt people at the lower end of the income stream. When we realized we had consensus as to what our intent was, we decided, okay, let's go ahead with the $15 minimum wage and see what we can come up with. Um, hang on just a sec. So, uh, three, was it three reasons, three persuasive arguments. One was um, that this would contribute to the health and well-being of the worker. Again, that was our one of our primary objectives. Uh, for those who are fiscal conservatives and worried about the economic side of things, we said, well, this a $15 minimum wage would help make people more self-sufficient and self-sustainability. So if you don't like the idea of people being on welfare or taking part of other benefit programs, a $15 minimum wage might help lift them off of that. Um, and then, uh, and since we call ourselves a democracy. We thought it would be uh, good to give power to those who are less empowered, and we know that money sometimes equates to power in this country. So by upping the minimum wage, you're giving people a greater voice by having more income in their pocket. So we thought that was a good thing. For the actions that we would take, again, um, going back to the fiscal conservative side of things and trying to make a logical argument, we said um, you should lead the, we should encourage the corporations who lead by example. Be a Costco. Pay people a living wage, and not only will it make their lives better, it'll help your bottom line, and people will want to shop at your place because they see uh, you treating your workers more fairly. A second was to a second action is to promote grassroots act, um, activism. So the people who will be most affected by this immediately, the people making the $15 minimum wage, encourage them to organize, get out, you know, support this, have a voice. Uh, don't tell them how to get it done. Be their ally and work with them to get it done. And then the third was to encourage people to work for and vote for those political people who could help make this happen. You know, actively support your legislators, your mayor, at whatever level you find yourself, $15 local minimum wage, $15 federal minimum wage. Make it work. $15 minimum wage. It's good for those at the low end. It's good for everybody. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. So something really interesting there was tying the $15 minimum wage to democracy, right? So there was a very smart link between something at a level here to the bigger picture. So maybe you don't care about the minimum wage, but you care about a strong democracy. So that was a powerful argument. Okay, I think smartphoneers, right? Here we go. Hello, I'm Josh. And if this room is, you know, if our group was representative of the room, then uh, there are probably some of you out there who think that smartphones are not a good thing. Uh, but on the whole, the majority of you think that they are. And so, sure. And so we tried to decide why that was. And top three reasons we came up with were that you have incredible access to information, you are much more connected to people and services and uh, anything you want to be, and you're much more productive on the whole. The flip side is that there are uh, times where you're less productive because you're too connected. Uh, maybe people keep distracting you, you're on Facebook all the time, you're not getting your work done. But on balance, how do we make this come out on top? So as a whole, we thought there would be maybe three strategies. One, try doing without your cell phone for a week, <laughs> if you can imagine that. If that's too traumatic for you, just try imagining do it without your cell phone for a week. What did that Right, there should be therapy. Columbia should maybe offer some, some cell phone therapy. 
Um, from that, either the exercise of imagining it or just doing without it, see uh, what we have seen, that you're incredibly connected. Uh, you know, we, we talked about some of the reasons why connectivity might be interesting. Um, I had this experience where I felt like I could let my daughters go out more freely because they had cell phones, and so we were constantly in touch with each other. Uh, we talked about the technology where elderly folks can have a device that calls for help if they fall and, they, they, you know, and so forth. So these are very compelling reasons to stay connected, to have this technology. How do we combat the downsides? So after you've deprived yourself or thought about what it would be like to be without that, um, identify the best and most important things for you and make use of those things in your smartphone technology and really identify the downsides uh, of the cell phone and figure out how to minimize that distraction, uh, the constant contact, and put it away, put it in a drawer, turn it off for a while and go on vacation so that you actually get rest and uh, can just focus more on the benefits of it. So on the whole, if you use those uh, tricks, we think that you'll come to the decision we did, which is cell phones are much better to have. Okay, so, the, so here, thank you very much. So, for example, I would leave that one with, the theme is the benefits outweigh the challenges. Okay, so that there are challenges with smartphones, but on balance, which I thought was a per persuasive argument, like try not having your phone for a week. Okay. And that was not really a logical argument, that was actually an emotional argument, right? Because I felt that in my stomach, like, oh, God, I need that phone. Okay, excellent. All right, so, um, who wants to share something through this exercise? And the exercise was not just about presenting. The exercise was meeting with a bunch of people you didn't know, coming to an agreement, agreeing who was going to speak, and what you were going to say so what does someone want to share they learned about motivation through this whole exercise? Who wants to share? No? About being motivated. What motivated you to do this? Who has the thought? Yes. So there was value in the process. The bottom line is you know, that different people contribute to different things, some with experience, some without experience. Everybody has an opinion, not everybody has experience. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, when our group got together and we started talking about different approaches, um, where it landed was uh, that there was value in the experience of the, maybe the smaller number of people in the group who had been through this or witnessed it. Uh, and, and that's something that tracks well with, you know, correlating to the alumni club with which I'm working. Uh, you know, that those who are more motivated to participate in those who have something that they feel that they have to contribute. So teasing out that value and creating an environment of inclusion, um, respecting minority opinion and hearing that thoroughly are, are all principles that really can help with the persuasion part. Because, because people feel included, right. So people are motivated to do something when they feel included in the process, not necessarily about what the end result is, okay? All right, who wants to share something you learned about persuasion or persuading? Yes, we got a couple persuade, yes. It's from the perspective of a logical argument punctuated with some emotion, with some nostalgia, with other things. But I don't think I heard any group come in with an underlying structure of emotion or anything like that. It was a logical approach. Maybe it's a Columbia thing. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say the sense of community was important. I mean, when Carol Ann ended up saying, even if you disagree, let's come down to the, we all care about the worker. I mean, I think that was a great way to bring us all together and, and allow for, for the emotions. Okay, so appealing, when being persuasive, it's really thinking about what we call, it's the, all the stakeholders, okay? So not just thinking about the people that you agree with, but also the people that you don't agree with. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now what I'm going to do is do some very specific tips that you can write down, that you can, you can learn to practice, first specifically as it relates to motivation, okay, which is separate from persuasion. Okay. And these are, are things that people who are no longer in what you will realize is most of these things you do in kindergarten, 
but then you graduate from college or grad school, and then you're basically set adrift in the world, whereas the things you learned in kindergarten are very helpful for motivation. So number one is daily habits. So making a list of five daily habits that you do every day, like make your bed, for example, or make sure you have breakfast, things like that, and then checking that off every day. So to retain motivation in the 21st century, having those habits and don't put them in your phone. Put them on a piece of paper. Because the purpose of your smartphone is also to constantly distract you. Okay? So if you put your daily habits in your phone and then you look at CNN or something, you're lost. Okay? So that's number one. Um, to our point, if you want to stay motivated, remember that the purpose of that phone that you carry around with you all the time is to convince you to care about the thing that the person on the phone wants to, you to care about. In addition, they have all your personal data, so they know exactly how to distract you specifically for what it is they're ever they're trying to sell. So developing some of the boundaries we talked about is great. Okay, number three, it's the newest rage of the 21st century, is taking some time to meditate. So meditation, there's a lot of great apps out there. Basically, imagine, you know, when your computer's not working because there are too many apps open, and you're, like, and you're like, I don't know how to fix it, and then you shut it down, you turn it back on, and it works. So meditation is really, and you can do it just for like three minutes. There's an app called Headspace, it's great. And it's like you've shut off your phone in your head, and you've recharged it, okay? That, that's a great tip for motivation, okay? Finding purpose. Finding purpose, meaning it's very unique, it's very personal, but it's understanding why you've put on this earth and what it is you're trying to accomplish, right? So for me personally, I have felt a very important purpose around making people's work and life valuable and in balance. Because, you know, let's say I used to work 80 hours a week and I didn't have a personal life. And I got paid a lot of money, but I didn't have a life. So to me, Creating systems and approaches where people can find that appropriate healthy balance is a purpose for me, and I am motivated by that, okay? Social team. So, for example, think of you, every person, if you have your own board of directors, these are the people around you that are supporting you in your, in your motivation. A way to do that is to really let, let's say, four or five people know in your circle, this is what I want to accomplish, Okay? and let them hold you accountable. Working with a coach, that's what we do for a living, is you tell me what you want to do, I tell you how you're going to do it, and then I hold you accountable to it. When In our daily lives, without that type of support system, what happens is you think of something, and then you think of something else, and then you think of something else, and then you think of something else. Okay. Um, higher purpose is a little bit what we talked about with with your group around, we talked about the minimum wage, but you talked about it in a way of supporting and, and growing democracy. So whatever my personal purpose is versus a bigger purpose will drive you to be more motivated. Okay, another one for my Columbia alum, accepting failure. So people lose motivation because they want to get an A. Okay, but once you graduate, there are no grades anymore. So there's no such thing as failure. You cannot fail because there's no grading system. So whenever you get a setback, whatever the setback is, it's really reframing that setback as a learning. You say, what did I learn from that experience? And moving forward. So, so what I want you to get out of your mind when it comes to motivation is you cannot fail anymore. Okay? You just, there isn't a system for failure. Okay. Journaling is great. So you, you put a journal next to your desk. You start to write. Write out your story. Everyone has a hero's journey. Each of you are on a journey, and you're a hero of your own story. So when you journal, you get to, and then you read back after a month, you'll be like, wow, I was so worried about that thing. That seemed so important. But you can start to stitch together where you're headed. Okay? And then gratefulness. And gratefulness is, is why people lose motivation, is they forget what they got. Okay? So ten, 15 years ago, when I became a coach, the idea of being able to run this group, present this to you, get an opportunity to share what I care about is like a miracle, okay, for me, because it's something I really wanted to do. So I I'm, I'm always remind myself to be grateful of where I am on the path, okay? So these are just some tips for personally for you in your work, in your personal life, 
working with the clubs, of how to remain motivated. These are particularly important in the 21st century because we have all this distraction, which maybe 50 years ago you didn't. And also 50 years ago, for example, in careers, there weren't that as many options. There's so many more options, so it's hard to understand how to get motivated. So some of these problems are modern problems. Okay, great, I said. Persuasion tips, all right. So these are when you're trying to persuade people, and as we said, Columbia people use too much logic in order to persuade. Here are some other ideas around how to persuade. Number one, understanding power structures, okay? So for, I'll give you a quick, easy example. In an organization, let's say, a very powerful person is the assistant to your boss, okay? Why? That person, I get paid more than them, I'm more important than them. That person decides who gets to the, to the boss, okay? So understanding within any organization where the power lies and why is an important use in persuading, okay? Number two, related to that is influence. Actually, you can't force anyone to do anything anymore, okay? Because even that whole notion of power is changing. You can only influence people. So like you guys said, in terms of with the boss, it's like you say something and then you leave it, which generates influence, and then you tell someone else about your idea, okay? So I really like this four-day work week thing. I want to influence people to take it on. I've shared it with you, then I'm gonna leave it. And one of you will carry it somewhere else. And maybe somebody will talk to the head of the Department of Labor and then it'll come out and it'll happen. Okay, stakeholder management. So basically there's powerful people and not powerful people. And there are people inclined to help you and people inclined not to help you, okay? So when you're thinking about moving something forward, do not underestimate the power of the powerless who don't want to help you, okay? Do not underestimate the power of the powerless who don't want to help you. So a lot of times when I work with people around moving a, a project forward, I'm like, tell me who the cynics are. Tell me who the people are going to the water cooler and saying, this is never going to happen. We've tried this before. It never works, okay? Those are your cynics. Do not underestimate their influence and power to undermine what you're after. Okay, persuasion, like we talked about. Using subtle fear, not over fear, to make your point. And the inverse. Using hope, having a hope of a brighter future. Mixing those two together are very persuasive. Remember, fear and hope are not logical, right? Those are feelings we feel, right? Human beings have inordinate amount of uh, fear of things they shouldn't be afraid of. Many, many people are afraid of flying, except flying is probably the safest way to get from point A to point B, okay? So fear and hope are very persuasive, okay? Like I said before, repetition. So all of you, when you did your presentations, did not, but need to, end the story with the beginning of the story, okay? And if you look what I said to you at the end of our process was, what did you learn, okay? People take away very few pieces of data in any situation. So if, if we could have a three hour conversation and maybe you'll take away one thought. And if I get one thought out of you and remember it, I'm, I'm successful, okay? Rewards and punishments. Okay, so to be persuasive, people have to see a potential reward or a downside in any action or any activity, okay? And those things relate back to what we talked before, a hit to the ego, right? Any, any of those types of things, okay? To be persuasive, you need to have accountability. Therefore, let's say you're running one of your groups and you say, we're gonna meet, like for the Columbia Coaching Group, I meet with all 25 uh, coaches uh, once a quarter, Okay, so it's once a quarter, we all get together, we get on the phone. They know that there is that expectation that we're gonna meet. We track how many people come and how many people do not come. At some point, if you don't come, you're really not gonna be part of the group, okay? I don't, not, I don't, I don't pay these people, but that's the way I create accountability and expectation, okay? Now the last two are the most powerful, if you wanna persuade people, which is to listen to them. Okay? And listening is separate than hearing. And listening is a skill. 
One of the things they train in coaching school is you, I say, ask you a question, and I have to wait 90 seconds for you to think about it and to answer and to be silent. Okay? So in order to really listen to someone, you have to ask a question, not think in your mind what you think the answer is. You have to just patiently wait for an answer and listen. And when someone is heard, truly, truly, truly heard, you will be able to persuade them. Okay? And a deeper way of listening is also follow up the question with three more questions. So I always say when people come to me and they're like, Eric, I really want to be a coach. I'm like, if you're not curious about human nature and hum humans, don't be a coach. You have to be genuinely curious about the human condition. Okay. I want to just take you through, this is sort of a specific tip for you in terms of, let's say, creating your own bio. Your own bio that would be shared digitally or personally. So it used to be that your resume was really important, right? But nowadays, when someone's looking for, to hire someone, they Google you, and they look on your social media first. So it doesn't matter what you put on your resume. It needs to look nice, and there shouldn't be any typos. But that's not what people are looking for. They're looking externally. So what I try to help people do is develop a bio, which basically is the description of who you are, not the specifics of where you worked, okay? And we're going to use all the tools we just talked about in thinking about it. Okay. So, for example, we'll just, this is my bio, right? So number one, and this is like for the Columbia website or just for whatever I do. So Eric Horowitz is a leader in the international world of executive coaching based in New York. Eric supports enhanced industry experts with diverse backgrounds. So basically what I'm saying there is what do I want to convince people of? Okay? So now when you think about your bio or describing you, you want to start with what is it that you're trying to convince people of? What's important to you? Okay? Okay. And that's my website, and that's my, like, imposing picture of me. Okay? So that all goes into the branding, right? Okay. So now, the next part, remember I said, was power and influence. So this, the second part of, my, of the bio talks about me running the Columbia Coaching Network, being on the Digital Outreach Committee, and being very connected within New York. So what am I really saying? I'm not bragging. What I'm saying is, who am I and who do I know? Okay? So remember we talked about social being very important, where we are in the social network. So within your bio, you don't just want to say what you care about. The next thing you want to say is, and why are you important? Who do you know? You don't, it's, called, it's called the humble brag, hashtag humble brag. You don't want to be so overtly bragging that people think you're a jerk, okay? So number one is, is what are you, what's you, what are you try, point you're trying to make? Two is, is basically the name dropping, okay? Which can be done in many different ways. But in terms of persuading others, people make decisions based on your influence relative to others. So I work with a lot of, a lot of executive, uh, executives banks and all that stuff. The fact that I run the Columbia Coaching Network, is a, it's such a door opener, right? They don't ask any questions, anything. They just see that and then they want to talk to me. So it builds a lot of credibility. So your Columbia degree is very influential except when it's not, okay? So, and I coach Columbia people all this time. If somebody went to whatever perceived university they went to, where they perceived that as less than Columbia University, that, 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 that name dropping will hurt you, okay? And they won't tell you, okay? You just won't get the opportunity. So the point is, is when you choose who you are and what you know, you then also unchoose, okay? It means you're gonna be in this club, you're not gonna be in that club. Okay, and then the, the next part, which I told you in terms of persuading and motivating is telling people what you stand for. So I stand for the $15 an hour minimum wage. I stand for the four day work week. That's what I stand for. So if you want to persuade or motivate people within your bio, you have to, t you take a stand, okay? People who interview and are like, well, maybe this and maybe that, that's, that's not the most effective way to convince. The most effective way is to convince through taking a stand. So, okay. So what I just showed you were the kind of the three areas. If you have a bio, if you don't, if you haven't have one, you should write one. But basically it's very simply, like what can you do? 
And who do you know? And what do you stand for? Okay. And that's your, that's your story. And you keep sticking to that story, you're going to become more of a motivator and more of a persuader. Okay. So, so I always like to make this practical. So what can you do now? Number one is build your bio. And here's how you do it. So in your, think in your career of the three most impactful things that ever happened in your career. Starting from when you had a newspaper route. Okay? Whatever it is. It's like, so for me, I ran the Hartley Kosher Deli and the freezer broke. Okay? So all the corned beef went bad. So that was just like a really bad day because I learned if you're in food and, re- and food and the food goes bad, you, you messed up. But whatever it is for you. Okay? So three highly impactful, positive moments in your career. Then your worst disaster in your career. The thing that went just terrible. And then the fifth story is a made-up story of what it is you hope to be from, the, from where you're at, okay? And the more authentic you make that fourth story about what went wrong, the more powerful your story is, okay? Define and articulate things you're passionate about. So I have people do things you love and things you hate, okay? So th- you could just do it on a piece of paper. You go, I, like, I love black olives in a can just because it's easy, you can eat all the black olives, right? And I hate marzipan. Okay, you're like, why is he talking about food? What I'm talking about is how do you connect with the things that you're passionate about, okay? I love public speaking, right? I hate going to the library, okay? I don't know why. The point is, is what I'm trying to activate is what motivates you, all right? Expand your network. How do you expand your network? There's an amazing tool, it's called LinkedIn. On LinkedIn, there's a button, which is hard to find, where you can download all your connections into Excel. So you download all your connections into Excel. You look for like the 20 people that you know now, that you used to know, and you reach out for them to have coffee or have a conversation. That starts to grow and expand your network, okay? It's very easy. I always recommend doing this when you're not really looking for something. So if you have a job and you don't need anything from someone, and you reach out to them, you say, hey, I'd just love to hear what you're doing. That's a great way to grow your network. Unemployed, broke, calling all the friends you didn't speak to in 20 years, not a good way to grow your network, okay? That's a a hot tip, okay. Um, We all have your affinity groups and you're working with groups. The things I'm sharing today, share with them because that creates value and that creates people will be motivated because you're sharing with them something of value, okay? Um, And the the last tip was the tip I said about daily habits, which is, in coaching, we call it a personal operating system. So in the 20, like the four-day work week, in the 21st century, all of you could do whatever you want every day. A lot of times, you could work from home. You could work from anywhere, right? So to remain motivated, you need to develop your own personal operating system. For example... I have my own business. I wake up at 8 a.m. I go get coffee. I do X. I do Y. By 3 o'clock, I do X. I track my own personal operating system, okay? I I can't coach more than four people in a day because my energy shifts off. That's specific to me. I'm a a 1 to 4 p.m. person. I'm just, that's what I am. I'm rocking it then, okay? So, Each of you can develop your own personal operating system, which keeps you motivated. Okay, so those are some very specific tips you could do now. All right, so anybody want to share anything that you really took away from today that inspired you or motivated you? Who wants to share? Don't be shy. Yes, go ahead. You cannot fail. Okay. All right, you cannot fail because there's no grading system anymore. Yes, who else? Yes. So uh, how uh, emotions are really impactful in motivating and persuading others, but it's not like only fear that you induce, but you can also use other strategies to like build up on that. That's great. Okay, uh, one more. Yes. 
Okay. That, so let's say that's one of our biggest themes I'd like you all to take away with. The thing that got you into Columbia University, your great SAT scores, all that, very valuable. But what you want to start to access is how you feel. And then share how you feel with others to motivate their feelings. And it's not less than thinking. It's actually equal to thinking. Okay? And to your point, it's not just bad emotions. It's all emotions. Okay? So one tip that I do when people are too emotional on the reverse, I always say, do your multiplication tables. So let's say you're racked with emotion. I go, one times two is two, two times three is six, okay? That act, and you can see when you do that, in your brain, it kind of moves to another part of your brain when you do math. So just think of the reverse, is if you feel that you're in that multiplication world, step out of that multiplication world, and you're gonna access emotion far more, okay? All right, well, thank you so much for your time, and I really appreciate all your, your input, okay? And enjoy, thank you.